Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for joining to our first webinar of the Gulf Association of Endocrinology and Diabetes. My name is Dr. Thamir Al Isa. I'm a consultant endocrinologist and head of the uh, Endocrinology Diabetes Division at Jabir Al Ahmed Hospital in Kuwait. Uh, I'm really delighted uh, to announce the first GATE uh, webinar activity or any medical activity linked to this um, association that we would like to present to you today. I was in our first activity. The Gulf Association of Endocrinology and Diabetes is a nonprofit organization. It's constituted by a group of physicians in the field of endocrinology and diabetes practicing in the GCC countries and interested in building a medical society that deals with all aspects of this specialty of endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism. This society is established in 2020. It's a transition from the successful ACE Gulf chapter and it is, continues and carries the same enthusiasm and passion about knowledge and education. GATE welcomes you to its first clinical activity. I would like to uh, present uh, our first activity of the year. Uh, I'm really delighted to be joined by two excellent speakers and uh, pronounced uh, uh, clinicians and researchers in the field of diabetes and endocrinology. Um, our webinar first today is talking about diabetes in Ramadan, which is, I'm sure, uh, it influences a lot of practice with the further new updates that we're learning every day from that field. Our first speaker is Dr. Bashar Afendi. He's a consultant endocrinologist and the head of endocrinology division at Tawam Hospital, also a clinical professor, a faculty of medicine and health services at the United Arab Emirates. Um, I also want to mention that this activity is a CME accredited uh, by the DHA. Uh, Dr. Bashar, you can start your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Thamer, for uh, a nice introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Actually, it has, uh, it has been uh, really an honor for me uh, to be a part of this uh, association as a member of the board of directors. I uh, sincerely invite all our colleagues to uh, join this uh, exceptional organization. Now, in my presentation about uh, diabetes and Ramadan, I will talk about uh, the disagreement between physicians on the classification of uh, Ramadan risk. Then I will talk about uh, the development of the new diabetes and Ramadan risk calculator. I will talk about uh, pre-Ramadan medical assessment, then I will review two cases. Now, as you know, Ramadan fasting in patients with diabetes is associated with increased risk of hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia in patients with type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and also in patients with gestational diabetes, even if they are on diet. In addition, patients are at increased risk for dehydration, thrombosis, and DKA, specifically in type 1 diabetes. However, over the years, I mean, we have been uh, advising our patients with high risk uh, not to fast, but 78% of our patients, uh, the high risk ones, are fasting against medical advice, and 40% actually of our patients do fast without even uh, uh, getting to the physician and discussing whether they should fast or not. And not surprising to us from our clinical experience that many of these high-risk patients do fast and do uh, fast safely. Let me review this simple ca case with you and see how we could evaluate this patient. This is a 25-year-old medical resident. He has type 1 diabetes for 11 years. He has been treated with basal bolus insulin. Uh, he does not check his blood glucose regularly. He gets uh, uh, episodes of hypoglycemia once or twice per week, and he, he is symptomatic when he is hypoglycemic. 
Last Ramadan, he fasted 25 days and uh, he had a few episodes of hypoglycemia for which he broke his fast. He has history of uh, DKA 10 months ago for which he was admitted to the hospital. He has no diabetes complications, no retinopathy, no proteinuria, and his latest A1C is 7.6. Now the question, what, uh, what do you think the, the risk uh, level for this patient? Is it a low risk, moderate risk, or high risk? Just take a, a second for yourself to decide what kind of uh, uh, risk level for this patient is uh, diagnosed. Now, according to our survey, which I, I will present later, we, we uh, surveyed, we sent this case to 350 physicians and out of them 312 physicians answered and the majority of these physicians said this is a high risk 52 percent however you have six percent of the uh, expert physicians who par participated in this uh, survey said this is a low risk patient so you could i mean see here there's a big discre discrepancy in the evaluation so let's talk about Ramadan risk uh, classification disagreement. What could be the reason for this ag agreement between physicians? And I thought about these uh, many uh, uh, causes of that, but probably you will have more causes uh, of uh, uh, this agreement. Now we don't have uh, uh, guidelines, straightforward guidelines. We have always conflicting data from here and there. We don't have evidence-based medicine, except for a few studies. Again, I mean, uh, uh, classification depends on the provider expertise. Many times we have uh, missing or correct or incorrect information in the chart. We have, again, now the fragmentation of healthcare. Many patients, you do not even know if they have any cardiac condition, any renal, renal condition, because they're following in the private sector and so on. Then you have the poor communication between physicians and between physicians and their patients. You have some competing perceptions. You have different goals and values. You have differences in the, in the culture, cultural uh, issues. And then probably you have the competition between physicians. So what are the consequences for that? Of course, patients will, will not understand what's going on and that might affect their safety during Ramadan fasting if you give them different uh, uh, classification levels. Physicians at work, they will be more stress, uh, stressed. And also you have increased risk of liability when physicians are given different uh, risk stratification. And then you have this uh, uh, patient-physician relationship uh, uh, consequences that patients would not trust the physician anymore and they will doubt and they will not follow and they will leave the institution and so on. But after saying all of that, many uh, uh, positive impact might happen. And this is one of what we're talking about. Now, you have to think always about solutions and as solutions, uh, uh, possible ones for this problem, the disagreement, then you have to improve your documentation improve communications in your division and in, in, in the institution and between the providers and increasing knowledge for physicians. And this is a part of increasing knowledge. Then we're talking about establishing guidelines and very important, unifying the protocols, how to approach patients and how to label them as low risk or high risk. So now I'm gonna to introduce to you the development of diabetes and Ramadan risk calculator. And this is the task force that worked on this this year. Uh, Dr. Munir al arouj Dr. Mohammed Hassani, myself, and Dr. Shahla uh, Sheikh. Now this is a first step to establish a structured approach how to evaluate patients during Ramadan fasting. And actually we, we, uh, we built a lot of our uh, uh, classification this time on this previous study, and we subgrouped uh, risk factors to three uh, groups, patients related, Ramadan related, and diabetes related. We actually included 14 elements, and uh, 
we gave a score of zero for the optimal situation, and we gave the highest, highest score for the worst scenario. For example, for hypoglycemia, we gave zero if there is no hypoglycemia, and we gave 6.5 if the patient has hypoglycemia plus hypoglycemic and awareness. Now you could see here from the calculator that uh, here type one diabetes, we give one point for example, duration of diabetes, we give one point. Hypoglycemic and awareness, again, we give 6.5 points. Level of glycemic control, if the A1C is more than nine, we give two points. Self-monitoring of blood glucose, if it is uh, done and well done, it's zero. If it is not done uh, as uh, uh, expected, we give one point. And if it is not done at all, we give two points. Now for uh, physical labor, we added, we added uh, intense physical labor. We gave four points for that. We gave two points for uh, moderate, for moderate, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. Uh, for acute complications, we, we gave three points for uh, history of DKA in the last three months, two points for history of DKA or hyperosmolar state in the past six months, zero if there is no history of uh, DKA or harm. We gave for chronic uh, complications, six points for unstable chronic complications, 6.5, and we gave, uh, we gave zero if there is no chronic uh, uh, complication. The same for, uh, for uh, uh, chronic uh, kidney disease. For pregnancy, we gave 6.5 if the patient is not achieving target. And if the patient is achieving her target, she will get 3.5. We also consider frailty and cognitive uh, uh, function in elderly patients especially, and we gave 6.5 for uh, elderly patients who have impaired cognitive function. Uh, we gave, again, I will dis discuss this. For previous Ramadan experience, we considered if, if the patient had a bad experience last Ramadan, we gave one point. We gave, we considered fasting hours, more than 16 hours, we gave one point. Uh, and we also considered all types of uh, diabetes treatment, and we considered uh, uh, multiple daily mixed insulin as the highest uh, risk score. We gave three points for that. And if the treatment did not have any sulfonylurea or insulin, we gave zero point. After that, we add all points together and we come up with the level score. So if it is between zero and three points, we, give, we label that as low risk. I'm sorry, this is too sensitive here. And if it is between 3.5 and six points, we call it uh, uh, moderate risk. And in that case, fast and safety is not certain and patients should have a full evaluation and medication adjustment. And I will talk about that later. And if the score is more than six, 6.5 or more, then it is a high risk and patients should be advised not to fast because fasting is probably not safe. But again, we know that some high risk patients do fast. So now let me review with you the survey on Ramadan fasting. And this is again to evaluate the necessity for this new risk calculator and see if this is really uh, important uh, to be used. And this, uh, we had the 26 uh, uh, clinical scenario questions and we scored all of these cases. Uh, the, the task force scored all these questions and we sent we uh, uh, these uh, clinical scenarios to 300, 50 experienced uh, physicians from, from many areas in the world. Again, 312 uh, physicians answer, and we had a total of 8,100 uh, responses. Uh, we had six major areas, East Mediterranean, North Africa, Gulf region, Indian subcontinent, we had the Gulf area, and, uh, and also Western countries. Now, Surprising to us, we had the mean correct 
classification. So for a given equation, the mean correct classification was 53 with a huge difference, wide range between 33 to 91%. So for a difficult case scenario, 33% of the of the responders responded with uh, with a correct answer, and for the easiest case, only 91% of the uh, uh, participants agreed on the same uh, classification. Then the the answers were actually different by region, actually. So 48% of uh, of the uh, uh, participants from the Indian subcontinent gave the correct uh, 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 diagnosis or uh, classification versus 58% of the Gulf states that gave the correct uh, uh, risk level. Now, also risk uh, was related also to, to, uh, to uh, uh, the level of complexity and it looks as you expect that patients in the moderate uh, uh, risk level were more difficult for physicians to diagnose and high risk patients were uh, clear to 66% of the, of the participants. Type two diabetes was surprisingly also the, the, the difficult one to make a diagnosis type one and pregnancy were easier for providers to make a diagnosis or uh, uh, risk le level. Then not surprisingly also, we, 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 we noticed that uh, endocrinology uh, specialists made a, the correct diagnosis for moderate and high risk cases more often than other subspecialties. So the, the survey conclusions uh, said that there is a wide variation in Ramadan risk uh, stratification According to the new risk tool, many uh, patients are misclassified as low or high risk or moderate risk. And actually, we recommended that further re uh, uh, research should be done to establish the validity of this of views in this tool. So how do you prepare patients for Ramadan fast? Now, you have to identify your patients very early in the pre-Ramadan medical assessment, you have to classify their risk, you have to make the plan for their management, and you have to discuss with them the breaking the fast rules. Then you have to refer all patients for diabetes education, counseling, and for nutritional evaluation. Now, very important is to identify your patients very early. You should do that a few months before Ramadan, because if you could ident identify them earlier, then you could make a big difference and make, uh, might change medications, insulin, sulfonylureas, or so on, and you might make a big difference. We reported that good control before Ramadan is actually associated with less uh, hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia before Ramadan. So it's really important to try to discuss fasting issues with your patient long before Ramadan. Again, you have to classify your patient as low, moderate, or high risk. Then you have to discuss the risk with your patient. Then discuss the management of acute complications, hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia, when to go to the emergency room and so on. You need to discuss with them exercise teaching, what time they can do exercise, and consider always that taraweeh prayers are uh, a part of exercise. Then you need to discuss with them how to modify their treatments and always consider to, to give them a trial of fasting before Ramadan. That's why evaluating these patients before Ramadan, a few weeks before Ramadan is really important. Always when, you make, when you're making a deal with your patient, you need to discuss breaking the fast rules Yes, okay, you will fast and I will modify your treatment. However, when you have hypoglycemia, blood glucose of less than 70, you should break your fast. If the blood glucose is more than 300, then you have to break your fast. If you have any signs or symptoms of hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia, even if your blood glucose is well controlled, then you, st you still have to break your fast. Anytime you're feeling sick or 
you have to avoid fasting when you have acute illness, fever, nausea, diarrhea, fatigue, and so on. Then you have to refer all your patients to diabetes education, very important. Diabetes education uh, experts are the bridge between physicians and patients. They will evaluate patients' needs and they will document that in the chart. They will evaluate their knowledge and also they will evaluate how they take their medications, how they modify their medications and how they use their glucose monitoring and they should emphasize also how patients do manage their acute illness of hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia, especially for patients who are treated with insulin. All patients should be referred for an expert nutritional evaluation. Uh, 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 nutritional, uh, nutritionist, a certified one, will, will be concerned about weight management, time of, uh, of the meals, so hoar is really important for all patients and that should be a, a, a priority in the discussion, nutrient uh, balance, good hydration. So many advices will come from a, a, a formal nutritional evaluation. So let me review with you two cases and see how we could evaluate these, these cases and uh, what are the recommendations. This is a 67 year old lady. She has type two diabetes for 17 years. She has hypertension, hyperlipidemia. She has uh, coronary artery disease. She had an MI seven, uh, MI seven years ago, stable coronary artery disease. She has no complaints. She has no chest pain, no polyuria, no blurred vision. However, she is not compliant with her diet. Her fasting blood glucose is in the range between 120 and 180, postprandial 180 to, to 240. She has no reported hypoglycemias. She has good uh, physical and cognitive functions. She fasted uh, 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 Ramadan with no issues. And she actually uh, uh, observed regular fasting every Monday and Thursday by, by modifying her treatment. Her treatment includes glimepiride, uh, uh, amaryl, six milligram daily, metformin, 500 milligram TID. She is on citagliptin, 100 milligram uh, once daily, empagliflozin, 10 milligram once daily, losartan and bisoprolol, rosovastatin, ezetimibe, aspirin, and plavix. Her blood pressure is 138 over uh, 86. She has diabetic retinopathy and poor pulses on examination. Her most recent uh, uh, left ventricular ejection fraction is 60%. She has normal liver function and normal uh, thyroid function. Her GFR is 76 uh, uh, and her LDL 127, her A1C is 9.2. And now the question, what do you think the estimated risk level for this patient? And remember from the old guidelines, this patient is a high risk and should not fast because her A1C is 9.2. So what do you think now, according to the new risk calculator, what would you expect this risk uh, score to be? Now, according again to the survey, again, you have the same problem. 53% uh, uh, of the providers said this is a moderate risk patient. 19% uh, said this is a low risk patient. And 28% said this patient is a high risk and she should not fast at all. Now let's go through this calculator and see. She is type two, no points there. She dur uh, duration more than 10 years, one point there. Uh, no hypoglycemia, zero points. A1C of more than nine. She gets two points there. Uh, Suboptimal glucose uh, monitoring. Uh, she gets one point there. I'm sorry, I cannot control this. Uh, no acute diabetes complications, zero point. A chronic uh, uh, diabetes complications, yes. Stable uh, cardiovascular, she gets two points there. GFR is normal and she, is, uh, she has good cognitive function, so zero points. Uh, no physical labor. Previous Ramadan experience was excellent, zero point, fasting. Uh, hours less than 16 hours, zero points. And she is on sulfonylurea, 
uh, the new generation, she gets uh, 0.5 points for that. So when, when you add these points together, you get 5.5 and her risk category is moderate. So what are your recommendations for a moderate risk patient? So as we mentioned earlier, uh, moderate risk means that the fasting safety is not actually clear and patients would require full medical evaluation and medic medications adjustment and strict monitoring. And actually religious uh, recommendations would not go far away from these medical recommendation, would say that medical recommendation is the basis for any decision here. So again, you have to have this patient with the family in the pre-Ramadan uh, assessment. You need to discuss the risk, talk about diet, physical activity, discuss the uh, modif modification of treatment and the timing of med mo medications, how to monitor blood glucose and the management of acute and uh, uh, complications, hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia, symptoms and signs of hypo and hyperglycemia, very important. Then you need to discuss breaking the fast rules as discussed earlier. Now, very simple for this patient, uh, probably will cut the dose of uh, MRL to four milligram uh, and the rest of the medications will stay the way it is. For this patient probably should not be on Plavix and aspirin according to cardiology. So consider uh, referring to cardiology now or after Ramadan, that's fine. But again, very important for this patient is actually to monitor this patient and to see how you could modify the risk factors for this patient. And remember this patient is a moderate because of two points here. If you see, if you have seen this patient before Ramadan and you control this patient better, easily this patient will go from moderate to, to low uh, risk patient. Again, if this patient is having no hypoglycemia, if you modified her treatment, she is on uh, impagliflozin only 10, maybe she could be on 25, maybe you don't need the sulfonylurea for this patient. You could clearly modify this uh, risk if you have this patient checks her sugar more often. So please evaluate earlier and modify her treatment earlier to make a big difference during Ramadan fasting. Let, let me go very fast to a type one diabetes patient. Again, this is the same case I presented earlier, a 25 year old uh, type one diabetes for 11 years, normal examination. He checks his blood glucose whenever symptomatic. He's on a glargine, uh, 334 units at bedtime. He is on Novorap at 10 units in, in the morning, eight and eight before uh, lunch and dinner. He fasted last, uh, uh, this year his fasting is 15 hours. He's a medical resident. He has symptomatic hypoglycemia more than once per week at night and late afternoon he during work hours. And he fasted 24 uh, days last Ramadan and he had to break his fast for hypoglycemia. His A1C is 7.6 and his GFR is 112. He had DKA admission 10 months ago. Again, what do you think the risk for this patient? Again, when we uh, ask the, the same question to the expert physicians in the, in the area, again, 52% said this is a high risk patient and 42 said this is a for, uh, moderate risk. However, 6% said this patient could fast and this is safe. Now, if we go through the calculator type, one diabetes, one point, uh, duration more than 10 years, one point, uh, recurrent hypoglycemia, uh, multiple hypoglycemia, 3.5 points, uh, A1C more than 7.5, uh, less than nine, one point. Uh, he's not doing uh, uh, his SMBG as instructed. Another one point here, he had DKA in the last one year, one point here, and the rest of that, no chronic complications and good cognitive function zero points. Previous Ramadan experience was not excellent. He gets one point for that. And he is on the best regimen, basal bolus insulin, 2.5 for that. Even if he were on insulin pump, he will get 2.5 for that. So now if you add the score, this patient would score 12 points. And this is clearly a, a high risk patient. 
as 52% of the uh, providers mentioned. So what are your recommendations for this uh, patient? Again, you should advise him not to fast, but as we have always in the office, this patient is insisting on fasting. And you have to remember that the decision to fast or not to fast is a personal decision and you have to respect that. You have to discuss the risk with the patient. However, it's their decision and you have to do your best to help these patients. You have to have the family on many occasions, especially in young, younger patients who insist on fasting and so on. Again, medical evaluation and strict super supervision is really essential. Before Ramadan, maybe you need to modify some of the treatment. Maybe you need to improve the glycemic control. Before Ramadan, again, this patient is on the best management uh, uh, basal bolus. Then you need to discuss diet and exercise and consider trial fasting. Uh, nutritional evaluation is really essential for this Physician who is working hard, uh, maybe on call many times as a medical resident, uh, SMBG is really important. And I think this patient should deserves a CGA monitor. Uh, we reported that patients who even when not, we're not when they're not uh, feeding hypoglycemia, they have unrecognized hypoglycemia and also hyperglycemia. That's why probably a CGM for these patients are uh, needed for this patient actually. So how do you modify insulin for type one patients? We reported that most of the hypoglycemia happens in the last few hours of fasting after 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. That's why we recommend that you should cut the, the dose of the long acting insulin by by uh, 25 to 30%, the same for the intermediate insulin. You give the high dose at iftar time and probably 50 to 70% of that dose at suhoor. For the short acting insulin, you give the high dose at iftar time, you give 75% of that dose at suhoor and maybe 50% of that dose for any extra meal, a night meal that is probably uh, taken by many patients. Premixed insulin, you give the highest dose that you used to give before lunch, you give it at, at iftar time, 50 to 70% of that dose at suhoor time. For insulin pump patients, they should be followed in a, a specialized clinic. Usually we decrease the basal insulin in the last six hours of fasting and we increase the basal insulin in the first few hours of breaking the fast and we treat them with bolus insulin depending on the carbohydrate count. So for this patient, we will cut the, the uh, basal insulin from 24 to 16, and we will give the short acting insulin, the highest dose, 10 units we give at star time, and we give about 50 to 75% of that dose at support time. Always very important for type 1 diabetics is to have a glucagon available and very important for them to, uh, to wear a bracelet to alert people around them that uh, they have diabetes. For this patient I mentioned was not known to his colleagues that he has diabetes and that's why last Ramadan he had a few admissions to the hospital with severe hypoglycemia. Again, you have to consider cutting the risk for all patients. Again, if you control them better, if this patient had an A1C of less than 7.5, he will lose one point here. If no hypoglycemia, 3.5 altogether. So if you manage this patient uh, correctly and early, probably you could bring him uh, down to moderate risk and maybe to low risk if you work hard on them, on, on this patient with a CGM and so on. So my take home messages, physicians must quantify the risk of all patients and discuss risk level for their patients. Pre-Ramadan evaluation and close monitoring during Ramadan are essential. And actually we recommend that we need further research to establish the, the advantages of this new tool uh, 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 and uh, recommend uh, to work on that further. Actually, we have this 
tool now adopted in Saha in, uh, in Abu Dhabi, Al Ain, and we're happy to have this uh, tool used soon. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bashar. That was amazing. Thank you for the excellent lecture and the description about the cases and management uh, for diabetes in Ramadan. We appreciate it. Please stick around for the, uh, for the Q&As. Uh, and also want to remind you that uh, if you have any questions, please, you have the Q&A button so you can actually type your questions there and we will be, uh, our uh, speakers will be glad to respond at the end of the lecture. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Mohammed Hassanin. I'm sure everybody knows him. Um, Dr. Mohammed, he's, um, uh, he's a consultant physician at Dubai Hospital in UAE. He's an honorary professor of medicine at Gulf Medical University, uh, Cardiff University School of Medicine also, and he's the chair of the Diabetes in Ramadan International Alliance. So uh, no better than Dr. Mohammed Hassanin to talk to us about diabetes in Ramadan. Uh, so if you're with us, Dr. Mohammed, you can start sharing your slides. So, um, first of all, congratulations for your um, new society. I'm sure it will be uh, an asset for the region and many people will benefit from the educational activities. I'm delighted to be part of the, uh, its first educational activity. And I'm also delighted it's, uh, it's a good omen that the first activity is Ramadan. So, inshallah, Rabbana Ibarak. So Bashar have um, excellently gone through our process of the risk scoring, the dilemma that we had, the differences in opinions, and he demonstrated that into uh, two clinical case scenarios. I'm going to go further and demonstrate the process in general of what we should do in another two clinical case scenarios that perhaps will shed some light on what should we do with our critical cases. So let's go through the first case. You have here 56 years old admin officer who is working in an admin job. He's got, he's got type two diabetes for the last eight years. Um, and he consults you one week before Ramadan. So as if he comes to you today or, or tomorrow or something like this. He also have a history of hypertension and chronic kidney disease stage 3A. The current medication includes statin, two drugs for blood pressure and aspirin. Um, he's also on metformin, 1500 milligrams per day, glitlazide, uh, MR, maximum dose, uh, uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist that he takes weekly. And that started about six months ago because his HB1C was elevated at 8.3%. Um, his current EGFR is 56 mils per minute. Um, he usually checks his SMBG in the morning and that looks reasonable, between 100 to 130. Um, he gets the occasional hypoglycemia when he is late at work, so not that frequently. Um, he lives with his family, he's a non-smoker, and he's wishing to fast, but he's concerned about his kidney function. So let's just pause and go through the case again. So try to yourself highlight in your mind the, the, the key points. So his age is okay, he's not in his 50s, his diabetes is eight years, He's got CKD stage 3A, his ED, precisely his EGFR is 56, glycemic control is 7.4. Um, he's on sulfonylurea, GLP-1 and metformin. Um, blood glucose are measured in the mornings. Um, hypos are not frequent, but they do, they occur when he's busy with, uh, with work and not eating enough. So let me ask you the question now, uh, and I want you to do the poll. So please, um, uh, for our admin team, if we can apply the poll. Um, so what would be the current risk for this, art, for this person? High risk, moderate risk, low risk. Please vote uh, now. I remind you while you're voting, 56 years old, Type 2 diabetes, 8 years, CKD state 3A, EGFR of 57, 
Onsulfonylurea metformin and GLP-1. Hypos are occasional on busy days. They do occur. SMBG is, um, he does, he do it in the mornings. Nothing else in his history. Okay, I hope you voted now. Um, so perhaps we can see the score. Okay, the next question is the impact of his CKD on his health during Ramadan. Do you think that high risk um, will, so let me just put it here so that you can see, you can vote as we speak. So there is the high risk of worsening of his renal function. So we think his renal function will get worse or do you think he will get more hypos? Or you think he'll probably be okay, he's well controlled, or he has an increased risk of his blood pressure to be become worse. So choose the one that you think is most appropriate. Maybe in your mind there is more than one, but choose the one that you think is the strongest answer. Okay, so we go to the final question for this case. What is your advice regarding his medication during Ramadan as he insists on fasting? No need to change his treatment as he's well controlled. Um, stop the sulfonylurea, reduce the sulfonylurea, or add an SGL2 inhibitor um, for, for his treatment. We are one week before Ramadan or a few days before Ramadan. So what do you think would be the most important or, or the right choice? HB1C is 7.4. He gets the occasional hypo. EGFR is 57. Um, so no need to change. He's doing well. Stop the sulfonylurea, reduce the sulfonylurea or add SGL2 inhibitors. Okay, I hope you've voted. I'm um, not sure if we will see the answers now or we'll see the answers later. Um, if we're going to see the, uh, okay. So this is the answer. So the answer for this question is reduce of area is, is voted by the majority. Um, uh, the, 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 the admin will pass me the, the right, uh, the, 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 what you voted, guys, for the other questions, um, and we'll see it uh, shortly. Okay, we'll go through the questions anyhow. So I would here with you work on his discussion points. So uh, we need to think of his risk level. He's on modern sulfonylurea. He gets the occasional hypo. His glycemic control is reasonable. He has a healthy lifestyle. He do regular SNBG, but perhaps not enough for someone with CKD and fasting and um, want to fast. Um, if you want to do the risk score, the, um, the, the, the answers really, the, the, you need to up download this app, the Dar Academy app. If you were to download it, you will be able to get the full guidelines. You start it, you press this, and you will get the risk as you do. And this is really quite straightforward, beautiful, and easy. And also, it will include the, the plenty of other information for you. So I would highlight to go with you through the risk score. Um, you said, um, um, oh, oh, sorry, uh, he, he's type 2, so that's 0. Less than 10 years, that's 0. Hypoglycemia is infrequent, that's 1. It does exist. He's on glitlizide, MR, that's 0 0.5 no, uh, points. He's not on insulin. Um, glycemic control is good, that takes zero. Um, no macro macrovascular disease. His EGFR is um, below, um, uh, below 60, between 45 and 60, that takes two points. He does SMPG, but not as frequent as you would expect for uh, sulfonylurea and CKD, at least for Ramadan. So I would give that as suboptimal. 
surely this is something he can improve on. Um, he's not doing an intense physical job. His fasting hours are less than 16. He's not all those frail. His previous experience with Ramadan were good. He did not have the current problems. So with this, his score is 4.5. And actually his score could even improve from by one point, which will still make him on the lower level of moderate if he were to do the SMG frequent enough. But I doubt it will be, it will change from this unless we eliminate the other points um, such as, for example, sulfonylurea, although I'm not sure that we need to do that. So with your, let, let me go through what you've answered. So it's been sent to me, let me just go through. Um, so if the risk score, what risk score he is? Yes, 40% um, said he's high, 55% uh, said he's moderate, and only 7%, uh, seven people said he's low risk. So the majority are on the in the right answer, which is moderate risk. Um, and, and that's really why we should apply the, the risk score, it, it give us a good systematic approach. This is exactly what we described in when we asked people about the impression. But if you were to apply the risk score, perhaps it becomes a bit more clear. Now, this is the right answer as well for question, the second question. And let me tell you about what was the answer. Okay, so the highest, uh, the, the highest number of you, 42% um, voted that the fasting will worsen his renal function, um, followed by increased risk of hypoglycemia by 37%. The difference really is only six individuals. Then the last, the, the following option was probably no change as he is well controlled. That was actually 2017%. And increased risk of blood pressure that was only expressed by 3%. And that's not the right answer either. So let me show you what is the right uh, answers from our discussion. So what we have in the guidelines, what we have about chronic kidney disease, um, we don't have strong data. We have some studies, small studies. There are not huge amount of studies. But in the vast majority of the studies, we did not see a deterioration in renal function. Um, and that's, but nevertheless, we, we say that we would like to advise people with chronic kidney disease to avoid fasting. Remember that the moderate, they have options. They have option to fast and equally they have an option not to fast. They have the license not to fast from a religious aspect as well. This is a study that we've done on um, uh, uh, 25 patients from Dubai hospital with CKD stage three, exactly similar to our patients. And here, what happens to their parameters? I would like you first to see the p-value. So none of the p-values was significant. So blood pressure, weight, HB1C, and renal function did not change significantly. Did they change numerically in a bad way? No, they changed numerically in a good way. So systolic blood pressure numerically improved blood diastolic as well, HB1C as well, renal function, creatinine did not change and EGFR did not change numerically or statistically. So what really changed is the hypoglycemia. Before Ramadan, according to the CGM data of the flash glucose monitoring, 44% had no hypos and 39% had one to five episodes only 17% had more frequent episodes. When Ramadan was started and they had the sensor, the no hypos was there, but reduced to 27%. So do some people with CKD and fasting um, and diabetes, of course, sustain no hypos? Yes, about 27%. 43% will, will have mild frequency of hypoglycemia. But 30% would get frequent hypos between 6 to 10 or even over 10 um, episodes. I would like to remind you that perhaps this reflects the type of therapy. 
here in the study, when you look into the breakdown, there are plenty of patients who were on insulin, basal insulin in seven, bolus in five, premixed insulin in four. Sulfonylurea was in 11. So perhaps this describes why some people had no hypoglycemia at all, and some people had mild episodes, but others had more frequent hypoglycemia. And that perhaps is a, a marker that if I'm on insulin and CKD and I want to fast, or even sulfonylurea, we need to adjust the dose. So perhaps this actually take us to the recommendations. So what are the recommendations? The recommendation is that type of patient we should have picked up well in advance. We should have given this appointment well in advance of Ramadan so that we can give plenty of time for adjustment and for advice and so forth. Nevertheless, we need to advise our patient about the frequency of monitoring um, to make sure that they hydrate themselves well during the fasting hours. If they insist on fasting, then the renal function and electrolytes need to be monitored. And of course, they need to have the right indication and avoid food that is rich in potassium and uh, phosphorus. I would not add a new therapy for him, uh, not because it might not be helpful or we don't want to get his glycemic control better, but because it's a bit too soon. From renal protection point of view, uh, SGL2 could be better than GLP1s, but that's not the right time. And delaying by one month is not such a big deal in this scenario. Should we do nothing? No, that's not an option. Should we stop the SU? That's not also advisable. We should reduce the dose because he's well controlled. And this is what we said in our recommendations. In our recommendations for people like this person on multiple therapy, we said they are likely to have plenty of comorbidities. They're likely to have diabetes for a bit longer and the risk of hypoglycemia is high. So we should be generous with their dose this reduction between 25 to 50% of insulin and or sulfonylurea. So here he is on 120 milligrams of sulfonylurea of the glycoside MR. I would take it at iftar and um, reduce the dose by 25 to 50%. Because of his renal problem, I would reduce it to 50%. So I'll give him one tablet a day. If he was not a renal patient, I probably would reduce by half a tablet so we'll keep him on 90 milligrams. If he's on the shorter acting um, sulfonylureas, then the iftar dose would remain the same and would reduce the exohur dose by 50%. And we say, try to avoid labenclamide. Metformin is no problem, no need to, uh, to change the dose or reduce the dose. Um, once a day, if it's once a day, twice a day, exohur and iftar, if it's twice a day, the XR, you can take it once daily or twice daily according to what the patient does in normal days. GLP-1 receptor agonist, no need to reduce the dose, no need to change the timing of the weekly. The timing of the daily, then it's best to be taken at iftar. There's some studies on lixizinotide and, and some studies on liraglutide. And in the past, a small study on exenotide and that uh, what, what they were all doing what we know GLP-1s do. But because of the um, uh, the potentials for GIT side effects, we do not advise to initiate within two to four weeks from Ramadan. Monitoring in this case is really essential. Monitoring during the late afternoon, Astra to Maghrib, is to pick the patients at the highest risk of hypoglycemia. At other times of the day is for possible hypo as well as the postprandial uh, peaks after eating if people would to overindulge. Crucial for the patient to reinforce the symptoms of hypo and hyper, and crucial for them to stop the fast if they have either of them, because that really would be quite important. Another very important point that we noticed from the Diamicron MR trial, where only 19 patients had hypoglycemia out of 1,200, but 18 of them were the people who were, were not probably taking suhoor because they reported having less than two meals, two or less meals. Uh, and obviously with nine hours of eating, probably some people will have to, uh, uh, maybe two meals and a snack. So we were just wondering 
whether these people were missing support, so their fasting hours is even longer and longer. We want to advise people, specifically those who are on insulin or sulfonylurea, to have less of the high glycemic index carbs, to increase the protein and the healthy fat for support, such as what? Eggs, beans, cheese, uh, fish, chicken, um, some fiber is fine. Uh, the carbs will come from all of this. You notice I have not mentioned bread or rice or potatoes here because you want to reduce that as much as possible. You can get the carbs from perhaps the beans and the dairy products um, already that they include lactose. And um, don't forget for this particular person post Ramadan to have an assessment. This will be very helpful for the following year. This person renal function hopefully will remain stable, but it's unlikely to jump up to normal unless it was only impaired because of uh, uh, something sudden. But if this is chronic process of diabetes and hypertension, then it's unlikely to be better by next year. So taking stock of what happened this year is really quite important. So I hope this case have helped to go through the process of how do we apply the knowledge we have from the guidelines the risk score, the um, knowledge we have from the studies about clinical case scenarios, um, all this would be really quite important. Let me go through my second case. Um, uh, hopefully it will be uh, smooth and, and, and not too long uh, either. Um, okay, quickly the second case. It's, it's a bit shorter than the first one. So that is a person who is not terribly dissimilar in age. He's a lawyer, 56 years old, nine years of diabetes, on metformin and citagliptin and Novomix 30, where he takes twice a day, 30 units in the morning, 22 units in the evening. The insulin started eight months, or that type of insulin started eight months ago. His perfect control now, HB1C 7.2, maybe, maybe very good rather than perfect, if I can correct myself, his SMBG um, in the morning, uh, it, I mean, he, he checks three to four times weekly. So perhaps on someone with doing intensive insulin, that is suboptimal. Um, and the range is not that. He gets about one hypoglycemic episode or less than one per week. Um, he's a guy who enjoys the social activities of Ramadan. And with this, you wonder whether this is a bit overindulgence in Ramadan. Other parameters are fine. And he asked you about fasting because last year he was not on, on insulin. So uh, we don't know what type of other therapy he was on. Maybe he was on sulfonylurea as well. And he was put on mixed insulin uh, twice daily. He's doing well. His glycemic control is good. His frequency of hypos are not high. So let's vote for the risk score. Remind you again. Middle age, uh, diabetes for nine years, um, lawyer, not, not a, a, a intensive physical job, HB1C is good, hypos is less than one, he's on intensive insulin, which is Novomix twice daily, plus metformin and citagliptin, no cardiac renal or other health issues. Vote now, please. Okay, perhaps the admin can show us the response. Um, okay, um, so some people saying moderate, 41%, that's the highest rate. So you can see the split here. You can see it's, it's a kind of split. There is no overwhelming majority. Um, so 41% saying moderate, 37% saying low. And that's quite interesting because this is a patient on twice daily mixed insulin and 22% uh, says he's high risk. Thank you. Let's go to the next question. So what is your advice regarding his medication during Ramadan as he insists on fasting? No need to change his treatment as he's well controlled. Stop morning insulin. Um, 
reduced morning insulin produce both the evening and morning insulin. So um, tell us please what you, um, um, what would you be considering as the option that you would vote for? Please vote now. Okay, perhaps the admin can show us the response. Okay, reduce morning insulin. No need to change is very low. Stop morning insulin is also pretty low. Reduce both is voted by 29%, so a sizable proportion. Let's see what recommendations we have and what evidence we have. So here are the main points. He's a guy on twice daily mixed insulin, stable lifestyle, hypos are not so frequent, good glycemic control, SMBG can improve, and he wants to fast. Let's apply the process. Type one, type two, zero. Less than 10 years, zero. Hypos less than one per week, one. Mixed insulin is three, that takes, that he takes him to four. Good HB1C, um, so nothing here really. No macrovascular disease, no renal problems, no acute complications. He's not doing SMBG as frequent as, uh, as, as should be. Someone with twice daily mixed insulin should be doing a couple at least every day. So that's not appropriate. And so he takes one. Um, other points are low. So his current score is five. That could reduce to four if he were to commit to starting doing his SMBG more frequently. So that would take him to four. So he's well into the um, uh, moderate, not terribly far from the low, if he were to improve his uh, uh, frequency of monitoring. But apart from that, we cannot really change very much in his risk, in his current risk score. So we cannot get him into the low marker because it would be impossible for someone on mixed insulin to not have hypos, hypos at all. Um, and he's already with good control, so it's the type of insulin. Whether we need to rethink about some of the insulins, perhaps that is something for discussion. So, uh, um, so that's the improvement that we can have on him to improve the score. Um, let me just go through, I think I had already the answer, so I'd like to thank the admin for the support. What about insulin studies in Ramadan? We have a number of studies that have looked into the mixed insulins. I was the first author of this study uh, looking into Novomix versus the Degladet with Aspart. And overall, what we say is for someone like him, normal dose at iftar and reduce the suhoor dose. By how much? By 20 to 50%. But very importantly, give your patient an algorithm. This is really crucial for a patient on insulin. Give them an algorithm so that they can check what they're doing, adjust the dose. Even if you opted for, I would like also to reduce the iftar dose. I, I don't see a major issue with that because if your decision was wrong, you will be able to correct it from the pre um, in uh, uh, target, okay? So, so you will be able to see that and then you will be able to adjust on the dose. Obviously, if one, someone is taking once a day, we'll adjust once a day. What about here, if the patient is on high doses, let's say 100 units, um, would you still reduce by two units? The answer is no, that need to change to percent. So 10 to 20%. Again, the reinforcement of the algorithm. We applied that in the study that I've alluded to. This is beautiful study, randomized control trial, and here is the Suhoor dose. Before Ramadan, the dose was increasing gradually. We got to a maintenance level where the dose was hardly changing. Probably the person got to his target. First day of Ramadan, mean dose was 37 units. That was reduced to 21 units. This is about 45% reduction in the dose. And it remained until end of Ramadan, probably the same, 21 to 20 units. First day of Eid, go back because the person would be returning back to normal eating and even, of course, the festivities. The iftar dose 
no change. Increased, increased gradually, got to the maintenance stage and remained the same. And it was the case for both types of insulin. So that really can apply to any type of low mix insulin. Trial fast is really quite important. I think we've missed the boat for now. Khalas Ramadan is a um, um, few days from now, so we don't have. But in general, remember to advise your patient who are, is on insulin, specifically on intensive insulin, wishing to fast, to try fasting three consecutive days in the month of Sha'ban and possibly Ragab as well, so that they can test themselves and see what they can do. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohammed Hassan. I really appreciate the, uh, the excellent lecture. Um, we are uh, now we're done with the two, um, with the two, our two speakers of the two uh, lectures, and we're open now uh, the, the discussion. We have we have good time now to talk about your questions, your concerns, and um, please write them down in the Q and A button. There we will have uh, uh, the questions there, Dr. Bashar. Thank you for joining us again. So uh, there are some questions already posted, so I'm gonna read them out and uh, I'll be directing to you both. Okay, so um, first question I'll deliver it to Dr. Bashar. I think it was mentioned, you already mentioned it, but maybe someone needs further explanation. Uh, in the risk uh, stratification of the assessment, there was the negative Ramadan experience. Now, what is that meant and how would you uh, score it? I mean, uh, the, uh, many factors will, will, will be there. I mean, you're talking about history of severe hypoglycemia, probably hospital admissions, ER admissions, how many days your patient broke the fast last Ramadan. Many factors, but remember exactly like the case uh, Muhammad presented that many factors last year probably changed this year. So you have to consider that. And the glucose control, the, I mean, A1C and so on, will give you a better idea. So whatever happened last Ramadan might not be an important factor this Ramadan if, if the control changed and improved. So again, severe hypoglycemia, ER admissions, breaking the fast, how many days and so on. Thank you. Um, Dr. Mohammed. Um... Uh, someone asking about pregnancy uh, with gestational diabetes and um, someone taking an injection of Detimer once a day. So maybe in just in a brief uh, for gestational diabetes and insulin therapy. So what do you think? Well, myself and Bashar are the co-authors for that chapter. Bashar is the lead for the, for the chapter. We both did some studies for, on, on this aspect, uh, whether in his hospital or in, in Dubai hospital. Uh, and the bottom line, to be honest with you, is a pregnant women should not fast during the month of Ramadan. It's not because of her ability to tolerate the fast. It's about why should the baby fast? The, the, the baby should not fast. The baby needs to have regular uh, feeding, regular blood glucose levels uh, throughout and not to have 15 or 16 hours with possibly low blood glucose levels. When we, and myself and Bashar, we were writing the first paper and we were reviewing the literature, we were surprised to see that healthy pregnant women get low blood glucose levels. So subhanAllah, the, 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 the license of a, a pregnant woman, regardless of, 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 of health issues, not to fast is for a reason. And for diabetic patients on diet and metformin in both the studies in Tawam and in Dubai, we saw long episodes of hypoglycemia. So hypoglycemia is going to be there. And then if the woman is hypoglycemic, the baby could also be hypoglycemic. The, the, and then it's not just about the hypo. When you see the CGMs after fasting, I mean, I've been fasting for many hours and I'm pregnant as well. How do you expect me after one hour, my blood glucose to be below 140 and after two, two hours, is below 120. Two pieces of samosa will <laughs> destroy that principle. So, uh, so I think my very strong advice for any healthcare professional is in a very nice way, advise your pregnant patients not to fast. If they insist on fasting, then apply all the principles of type one diabetes as Bashar have mentioned. The Levemir will be taken at iftar, reduce the dose by 25 to 50%, insist 
on the targets of pre of fasting and postprandial targets as much as possible. Would you recommend also CGM or flash for them? Of course, of course, uh, the, the, the better the monitoring because what we also saw in one of the studies that Bashar was leading from Tawam is that the regular SMBG is not enough to detect the, these variations. Mm -hmm. So they would be checking when they feel it is right and perhaps that will give us the wrong signals to take wrong decisions. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Uh, Dr. Bashar, someone is asking about um, managing severe hyper, hyperglycemias uh, during Ramadan, probably, probably somewhere around iftar time, and whether if someone is on oral therapy, maybe it's a good idea to keep with him a rapid acting insulin just in case for correction. Hyper or high, hypo? Hyper. Hyper, hyper, hyperglycemia. I mean, you're talking about more than 300, for example? Probably someone is asking about that, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, if the patient is on oral hypoglycemic agents, it's not practical to tell, tell them keep insulin at home also. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you have to manage on the next day. I mean, usually we advise them to break their fast on that day. Uh, there is no need to continue fasting if the sugar is more than 300 at all, especially if they're symptomatic. But on the next day, you, you need to modify their treatment. Excellent. Um, Dr. Mohammed, um, someone is asking about the cutoffs for the uh, for the uh, risk assessments. Um, you know, uh, above three is a moderate, above six is uh, is a high risk. Someone is asking why you're not considering other values. So where these numbers came from? So maybe in a brief. Sure, it is consensus from the from the authors as well as the feedback from many of the co-authors, the, the guidelines is 53 authors. We had feedback from many people, authors and non-authors as well. Also the feedback from the survey that we looked into as well as from the, from the studies. So what we tried to do from the risk score is, I mean, someone today asked me, send me a WhatsApp from Bangladesh saying, what about brittle diabetes? What would be the score? So by virtue, if you apply the risk score, brittle diabetes is type one most likely they would have long duration of diabetes. They are on intensive insulin. They have frequent hypos and possibly hypo unawareness. If you put all this together, this person is very high risk scoring. So I, I think it's just to an extent it's common sense and we would be delighted for feedback from people if they feel there is a specific point or a specific case scenario that is completely out of sync with the risk score. Uh, would be very happy in the future to adjust and modify. Uh, good, interesting. Uh, Dr. Bashar, um, I have a couple of patient situations and they need help if it's someone who can't fast or not. So someone with a pre-diabetes on metformin, um, any specific advice during fasting? Do you keep metformin for them or not? Well, I think fasting is good for them. I, I would keep metformin, yes. I would not stop it. Fasting is good for these patients. Yeah. And if someone with diabetes and NAFLD, um, is there any issue with fasting? Uh, probably same category of patients you're talking about. Right? Fasting is good for them. Yeah, so. okay. Um, Dr. Bashar, also someone is asking about hypoglycemia. So some, if someone had a hypoglycemia event during Ramadan and he's insisting on fasting the next day or going back to his regular fasting, um, is there any specific advice for him? I mean, if the, if the cause of hypoglycemia is clear, fine. If he exercised or whatever, if it is clear, fine. If it is not clear, then you have to modify the treatment. And probably for these patients who get hypoglycemic for no clear reason, probably you should consider CGM for these patients. Again, you need to modify the, the, the dose of insulin, as uh, Mohammed mentioned. You have to provide your patient with a clear access to your uh, service. Now, for example, in Tawam Hospital, we have a hotline that patients most of the time could call us or they could directly call the uh, educator to discuss with them any uh, uh, episodes of hypo or hyperglycemia and they seek advice there. So I would cut the dose of insulin the next day, yes. Okay, uh, Dr. Mohammed, uh, someone is asking about uh, the age of children to fast. So I'm not sure here if they mean diabetics or non-diabetic children, but uh, sure. probably we're talking about diabetes. For, for either. I mean, the official thing in Islam is 
albalgin, which means adults. So when people reach, not sorry, not adults as per, for example, ID or legal, is puberty. Um, and I think it's a gradual process. You, I mean, people will not go from one stage, one, one year, no fasting at all, to the following year, fasting the full month. Usually it's a gradual process. As for them to fast or not, emotionally, we say that uh, these young people with type 1 diabetes, um, they're quite young and uh, they should not fast. You need to think of them as, as type 1 because age actually is in their favor. They probably don't have long duration of diabetes with complications or hypo or awareness or whatever. So you just need to apply the same process. We've seen beautiful studies from many centers, mainly in the Gulf as well as in Egypt, um, where in the right hands, and it's a big if, in the right hands with the right tools, uh, some are able to fast, but that, cannot be generalized at all. Interesting, yes, that's excellent. Um, a couple of questions about post-COVID. Um, do you, Dr. Mohammed, any, anything in particular you think someone, whether he had a COVID before or uh, been yeah. cured because of COVID yeah. and now going to Ramadan? I, I saw that question and I think it, you need to apply your clinical sense on someone recovering from uh, an illness pneumonia, severe gastroenteritis, um, cardiac problems, whatever. When do you tell them to go back to fast? Forget it, it's COVID. Um, the only issue with COVID is we do see sometimes even post-COVID thromboembolic events. And the dehydration and the thrombosis that is already mentioned as a risk in Ramadan um, is there. So if someone just had COVID negative test now and just recovered, give them a few days to recover um, or even allow them to fast Ramadan a few months later. Um, they will still be able to fulfill the religious requirements, but after recovering completely. So it's very interesting, Dr. Tamer, when you, Tamer, when you see the religious fatwa from Al Mufti of, of, of Egypt, he is saying. Um, the prevention of probability of harm, not harm, probability of harm. Mm. So why wait until a problem happens? If, if, we, if, we are, if we have some doubts in our minds, the fact that we have a question means that the person has doubt in his mind and I have the same doubt in my mind as well. Yeah, yeah, that's probably true. Uh, Victor Bashar, um, I get this question a lot about patients who noted um, a hyperglycemia, significant hyperglycemia, more than 300 milligrams, for example, during Ramadan, during the time of fasting. And, um, and we tell them, of course, that they need to break their fast, but they don't they want to use just insulin to lower it. Um, how to convince them about more than 300 is dangerous and you need to break the fast? Well, again, I mean, uh, yes, more than 300 will cause uh, polyuria and might cause dehydration and might affect the renal function. And uh, if they're on insulin, I would recommend that they take insulin. If they insist on continuing fasting and taking, they should drink, I mean, for sure, they should have uh, the fluids. So clearly, I mean, increased risk of dehydration and uh, uh, then you will have the glucose toxicity and so on. So it's not advisable to uh, continue fasting if the sugar is really high. If insulin I, is available, not a bad idea. I would like to link that question with the COVID question because mm -hmm. hyperglycemia and dehydration are two of the risk factors for problems with COVID problems. So this year, we really need to make people as much as possible accept the scientific advice and the medical advice, if we are to say you're, you're better off not to fast, please follow it specifically from the points of dehydration and hyperglycemia. What Bashar have just explained is a potential for risk. So why put yourself into that jeopardy? Have some fluids, drink, go for a walk. If you're on insulin, take the insulin. Don't put yourself at risk. 
Thank you. Um, I have a few questions here, but I don't really want to uh, like get a lot of answers about it because we already this has been discussed about management, basically. Someone on what do you do on dimacron? What do you do on uh, uh, cytic lipid metformin? I think that's all very clearly de described in the guidelines. Um, let me try to see if there is any other interesting questions that probably would elicit some sort of a discussion. Uh, these are related to therapies. I have some questions here about also patients with, with other comorbidities, like cardiomyopathy, bedridden patients. And I'm sure the, the, the calculator, it's, that's what it's for, right? You, you apply these medical conditions to the calculator and then you get your risk. Um, let me just ask a question here outside of these, uh, what's, what's been read so far. Now, it, it, we always kind of uh, use Ramadan as a way of uh, protecting people from developing complications, whether it's hypo or hyperglycemias. Is there any way, safe way to use Ramadan as a therapy to manage diabetes? Can I take and I'd like both of you to share that. Yeah. We have the first yeah, study sure. we've done in education in UK, in London. 2007, we published that. Um, the, 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 we gave patient pay, we gave patient education. Obviously, they're all very passionate to fast. Not only we reduced hypos, but we sustained good glycemic control and weight reduction for 12 months. So, if if the passion for fasting with the right attitude, with the frequency of monitoring, with listening and attending patient education or whatever, is going to have a repercussions over the following months as well. So, I I think. If we provide our patients with the right tools and the right information, it will, will have some good benefits. Dr. Bashar, do you have any opinion here? Yeah, again, I mean, uh, uh, fasting, uh, intermittent fasting is advised in many cultures now. It is healthy. It's a type of treatment for diabetes and for weight loss and so on. As long as you're monitoring your blood glucose and addressing uh, the, the the abnormalities, hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia, yes, it's advisable. I just wanted also to emphasize that many of our patients, probably a diabetologist or internist, would not be able to uh, define their cardiac risk or uh, renal risk. You need to refer to nephrology and cardiology to help you. It's not only about diabetes. That's true. That's true. Um, also, we get, uh, you know, questions and concerns about people who would like to do exercises during Ramadan. So what would be the safest way to, uh, to deliver that message? Anyone could answer, please. Um, light to moderate exercise during fasting hours is acceptable, obviously with the patient checking and monitoring, and obviously with the right adjustment. Um, Taraweeh is part of the exercise. Any heavy exercise need to be done in the evening. Um, we saw from many CGM data that the highest rate of hypoglycemia is in the late afternoon. So people need to be careful at, at that time of the day. And if they wish to exercise, they need to check in advance. Um, if it becomes part of the routine, then perhaps they would need to reduce further the insulin or the sulfonylurea if they're on either of these. Um, to, to sustain their ability to fast. From my home city, Alexandria, in the sporting club, it's a huge sporting club. The jogging track, you cannot jog. It's packed with people walking. And the Cornish, the seaside, is also packed with people walking. So it's not a bad time for exercise, but the person with diabetes needs to think of his treatment and what time he or she are vulnerable before they embark on the exercise. Bashar, what do you think? Yeah, again, it depends on the type of treatment they're on and uh, the goal of exercise. Again, uh, mild, moderate exercise would, it would be okay as long as they're uh, uh, monitoring their blood glucose and uh, managing their uh, 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 low blood glucose or whatever. So again, yes, it, it, it is possible in the afternoon. Dr. Basha, would you recommend patients to do like a trial of fasting before the onset of Ramadan, like, you know, a few days before, just to test out how they are managing their diabetes and, you know. Yeah, we, 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 we do that actually on many occasions. However, remember that prolonged fasting for a full month is different from fasting for two or three days. Yeah. But this is really helpful. 
many of our patients do fast without even consulting with, uh, with us, Mondays and Thursdays. But three days in a row is really good and will give you a, a good sign that uh, with the medication modification you're doing for them. Yeah, many patients should be advised to try that, especially on insulin or sulfurias. Interesting. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I'm trying to figure out, like, you know, trying to see very in really interesting questions. So it would, um, someone is asking about switching patients from a premixed uh, insulin to a basal plus uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist before Ramadan. Um, any, um, any advice? The study we did was we sustained the, the mixed insulin. We adjusted the dose and it worked. Now, if you feel that your patient is better off to reduce the hypos and to benefit from the GLP-1 benefit, and you think this is a decision not just for Ramadan, but for the full year, go ahead and do it, but do it well in advance of Ramadan so that the GLP-1 um, doesn't cause the side effects for Ramadan fasting. So obviously it needs to be done over four weeks before the month start. But I wouldn't just do it for, for Ramadan's sake. I would only do it if someone feels this is a, a good option for my patient for the whatever reasons that the GLP-1 mix with insulin entails. It, it's, a, it's a good idea. Uh, we have one study that, but not switching from mix to, G, to the, both together. And we've uh, presented the wave one data during the DAR conference this year um, next year, inshallah, we'll have the full countries um, um, into, uh, into that data from the study. Thank you. Uh, I, I, can, I think we can conclude the session. Thank you so much, Dr. Rabishar, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, it was wonderful, wonderful to host you today. Uh, this is the first webinar activity, medical activity for the gate. We would like you to stay engaged with us, uh, keep um, uh, looking out for our information, our posts. Uh, we'll, we'll, you will listen more about us in the future, inshallah. Uh, thank you all for your attendance uh, to, for our lecture today. We really appreciate it. Again, our speakers, Dr. Mohammed, Dr. Bashar, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for that some moderation. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Ma'asalama. Thank you. Have a good night. Ma'asalama.